entire row of mill machines. The piece will come in, it is loaded into the machine, and it's milled down to the required specifications for that particular component. Last but certainly not least, I'm really excited to show you all the newest addition to Blue Origin Huntsville, a full-scale mock-up of our lunar lander for the Human Landing System program. This lander is powered by the BE-7 engine, which is the newest engine in Blue Origin's propulsion family. NASA's program is named Artemis because Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. And through the Artemis program, we are looking to land the first woman on the moon. Thanks for joining me for the tour today. I had such a great time showing you all around and I cannot wait to update you on what's next here in Huntsville. Oh, as mentioned, Patrick, we just opened that factory less than a year ago in February. And it's amazing to see just how mm -hmm. fast that factory is coming to life with all the machinery. Uh, it's also very cool that our lunar program is down there in Huntsville, given the rich space history that's in the area. That's right, from chariots for Apollo to landers for Artemis. Right. It's, you know, while we're on the topic of you know, all this great work Huntsville uh, is doing, you know, I'm excited to talk about something I'm especially geeky about, and that's Space Camp, which oh, is also too. in Huntsville. Me too. <laughs> Quite geeky. So I've always wanted to go there as a kid. I haven't gotten to go. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, our Blue Origins nonprofit club for the future is a partner of Space Camp, and they've been working together on various, you know, STEM programs. Uh, they've also gotten hundreds of their Space Camp trainees to actually, you know, make these postcards, which can be flying to space today on that New Shepard capsule. Okay. So our intrepid field correspondent, Caitlin Dietrich, was on the scene in Huntsville recently, and she got to go on a great tour that she didn't tell us about. I, I don't know how we missed this memo. I think we're going to, there, there are going to be conversations yeah, about this. Exactly. So we're all super jealous of Caitlin. Uh, let's see what she got to do while she was over there. Hey everyone, we're at Space Camp in Huntsville, Alabama. We're really excited today to talk about our partnership and Club for the Future and get a little tour of Space Camp and pretend to be an astronaut for a day. All right, well, let's get started. This is our Mars base. We've actually got some uh, basil over here. We had some parsley, so we're growing all sorts of stuff. Wow, let's see. On Blue Origin's last launch, NS-13, Club for the Future flew tomato spheres, seeds to space. We just planted a few here. Okay. Tomatoes on Mars. Yes. So, I love it. So we're going to head over and actually jump into Discovery. We tried to do as much hands-on and immersive activities as we can. Houston, we have a problem. Engineering design challenges, the missions and the simulators are of course a huge part of what they do here. So basically this is just going to get the idea of what it feels like to be out of control. It's like a tumble spin. Do I get astronaut wings after this? That is a cool rocket. Wow. That just never gets old. Whoa. There she is. So we're about to see a Saturn V and F1 engines fire on the historic 4670 test stand. And one day soon, you'll see New Glenn's BE4 engines fire on that same stand. All right, so let's check out our human landing system here. We got Lockheed Martin, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper all working together on an integrated human landing system. And now it's time to go back and build a sustainable presence. Club for the Future's mission is to inspire youth to pursue careers in STEM and help visualize the future of life in space. And so you've been making some cards with the kids and we're able to send them to space and then mail them back to the students. And this gives them the opportunity to see that space is about creativity too. And this activity helps drive that point home. You think about the history of Huntsville and it's so fitting for companies like Blue Origin to be here now because it was always about where the future of space is yes. going. There's so many opportunities in, in the world of spaceflight that these students go, I can do that? Yeah, the work you're doing here to inspire the future generations to pursue STEM, pursue space, I just can't imagine that you know space camp won't be a big part of our history for many reasons. I wanted to give this to you, let me, let me pin you here. I love it. All right, it's official. Oh 
man, I, I think she definitely deserved her astronaut wings for that one. I'm not quite sure how well I do in that tumble sim. I would not have done well <laughs> at all. Well, uh, thank you, Space Camp, for the uh, the tour, and we really uh, appreciate not only the tour, but also we're very proud to be able to fly a set of your wings on Mannequin Skywalker's flight suit to space today. Okay, we are at T-minus 12 minutes. Uh, we are in a hold here. We've said it in previous uh, webcasts. If we need a couple of minutes extra to prepare our launch today, that's quite all right. We spend years designing these vehicles and building them, months preparing for missions. So if we need a couple more minutes, that's quite all right. But while we have a couple minutes here, um, why don't we talk about kind of the broader mission that mm -hmm. we all in the space sector are a part of, and that's inspiring the next generation. Maybe to go into space, but definitely to go into other STEM, uh, STEM areas. So we actually have some questions uh, about space, I believe from some, uh, from some school students. So why don't we check out one of those questions? Hello, Blue Origin. My name is Alexander Mather from Fairfax County, Virginia. When I first arrived at Space Camp, I had no idea that my life would forever change. I learned that the opportunities in space are as vast as space itself. One of Blue Origin's most well-known creations is the New Shepard, a reusable space rocket. So, how do you make a rocket reusable? I understand the concept, but the way the system works is far beyond me. Help us understand how Blue Origin built the New Shepard reusable launch vehicle. Great question, Alex. Now, at the center of any rocket, but certainly at the center of uh, New Shepard's reusable rocket, is the engine. And that is absolutely critical to reusability. Mm -hmm. Because what that engine allows us to do is uh, take off like a regular rocket, but because it's throttleable, we can pull back on the throttle. That allows for a nice soft landing of the rocket, which means A, that we get the rocket back, and B, that it comes back nice and gently so that mm -hmm. the refurbishment on the rocket is rather minimal. So that is critical. That's kind of the, the secret sauce, if you will, to our reusable rocket is that incredible BE3 engine. Again, great question, Alex. Okay, we're at T minus 12 minutes. Again, we are still in a hold here. And while we've got a little bit of time, why don't we check out New Shepard as she gets ready for her flight today?
Welcome back, everybody, to New Shepard's 14th mission to space. We are T-minus 12 minutes to go until launch. This rocket that you see on the pad, she is getting ready for her first mission. You see she's looking uh, nice and shiny mm -hmm. new there. We're going to give her a couple of, uh, of reused rockets char marks, hopefully in a couple of minutes here. That should be exciting. But we are in a hold here. We just want to make sure we give some time to our teams to get aligned. And while we've got a little bit of extra time, why don't we take another question from a student about space? Hello, my name is Kier Fair and I am a sophomore in Lexington, Kentucky. My first experience with Blue Origin occurred three years ago while I was at Kennedy Space Center attending space camp. I had no idea that so many companies outside of NASA were involved in space and planet exploration. So the question I have is, what do you hope to gain from establishing human habitats on the moon? Thanks, Kira. Great question. So our vision at Blue Origin is millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth. And you're right, one of the next steps that we have on our agenda, if you will, is to go to the moon and this time to stay. And why is that important? Whether you're living on a, a space station uh, that's orbiting the Earth, or you're living on some sort of body out there in, you know, in space, we need to understand what it takes to live mm -hmm. long term uh, in this, uh, this difficult environment. And so by going to the moon, it's one of the, it's the nearest body where we can go there, establish a base, figure out how we can live and work in space, because it's, it's not easy when you're out there and you don't have any atmosphere and it's cold and you need to figure out how to transport oxygen and water and all those sorts of critical elements that we as humans need to live and work in space. So good question. Thanks, Kira. All right, why don't we throw it back to the rocket and wait here as New Shepard gets ready for her 14th mission to space and this rocket's maiden launch to space and back.
All right, everybody, welcome back to New Shepard's 14th mission to space. We're at T-minus 12 minutes ago until launch. Uh, I do understand that the team is dealing with some, uh, some mid-level winds, uh, as we've talked about in the past. Um, it, can get, it can get windy down there in Texas. It looks like a big, beautiful blue day down there in, uh, in Texas, but we do have to monitor the winds mm -hmm. for the rocket's ascent and, of course, descent. So we're going to keep our eyes on that for uh, just a couple of minutes here. But while we've got some time, Patrick, you, uh, as mentioned, you are part of our lunar program. Do you want to talk a little bit about your thoughts about why, why are we going back to the moon? Yeah, you know, Kira asked a, you know, a great question, which is, uh, you know, why are we going back and what are people going to do there? And, uh, you know, people are, of course, going to play a tremendous role in, um, in doing all the science, you know, on the moon. There's nothing really like having uh, someone trained as a geologist who can actually go there and actually see what's going on, as right. Jack Schmidt will, will, uh, will tell you. Um, but also, as we look towards the future, you know, we're going to want to use the moon, which is really a gift for Earth. We're going to want to use it to allow us to start, you know, building that future where millions of people are living and working in space. And what it means is we're going to learn how to use um, all of the local resources there. Mm -hmm. So the lunar regolith, the, the uh, uh, water ice that's there, and, and many other things we probably haven't even discovered yet. And so we need people there to help, you know, build all that infrastructure and then slowly start to come back off the surface of the moon and start building all of these great things that we want to have, you know, in space, you know, all, all over between, you know, the Earth and the moon. Right, right. I mean, sure, we went there 50 years ago, but there's so much more to learn. That's uh, right. And especially as technologies have evolved over the last five decades, there's so much more that we can learn. So it's critical that we go back and as this, as we said, this time to stay. Yeah, and by the way, we've actually never sent people down to the South Pole. So that's an entirely different part of the moon that Good is point. extremely special that we, you know, we've never been there. And I can, you know, we get so excited about all the great things we're gonna, you know, discover there, all the awesome surprises we're gonna have. Yeah, that, that will be a very, very good day. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're at T-minus 12 minutes, as mentioned. We are uh, still in a hold here, waiting for some mid-level winds to clear, and we've got our eyes on that. So we're going to give our team a couple more minutes. And while we've got a couple more minutes, let's see a question from one of the schools out there. Hello, I'm Beth Mattingly, and I'm a third grade teacher at Heritage Elementary School in the Madison City School System. My daughter went to space camp as part of the curriculum in Madison City Schools. Space Camp really opened her mind to the what ifs and possibilities of new things. This inspired me even more to bring space related STEM into the classroom. In my classroom, we talk about career opportunities. What kind of careers do you think will exist in space when Blue Origin's visions of millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth is realized? Thank you, Mrs. Mattingly. That's a, that's a wonderful question. You know, right now, when people think of space, they, they might think, well, you know, it's for engineers and scientists, and it's true. We need a lot of excellent scientists and engineers. But when we're ultimately living and working in space, we're going to need not just the, the engineers to get us there, but we're going to need all of these other people and other careers to help sustain people as we live and work in space. So we're going to need teachers like you, and we're going to need lawyers, we're going to need business people, we're going to need farmers, we're going mm -hmm. to need um, people to make deliveries, we're going to need all sorts of people uh, when we're ultimately living and working in space. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, I think, uh, Iron, you've, you've, you've hit it right on the head. You know, right now we're going up there to, you know, explore or conduct experiments, but at some point we're going to be up there to live and work. So you can imagine all of the skills that it takes to live and work are going to be required up in space. It's just, you know, you're going to, you know, add, you're going to be a space chef or whatever. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually, you know, our goal, like we said, is to go to space to benefit Earth. So we're going to want to lift a lot of that heavy industry, you know, off of Earth and actually do it in space. So I imagine, you know, a world in which we're going to have folks up there, uh, you know, working on all of the, you know, really heavy industry, whether it be, you know, generating power or building really highly complex machines, um, you, you know, all of those uh, uh, skills are going to be needed. And we're also going to need the, the filmmakers and the poets and all the people Great. that are going to, you know, look and stare out the window and look back at planet Earth and, and write all the things that are going to inspire us to, you know, keep going out into space. Think about all the, the, the songs and the books <laughs> and the movies that have been created already. Mm -hmm. And that's just with, what, 500 people or so that have ever been to space? Yep. Can you imagine once 
we've got millions of people living and working in space, the type of inspiration that they're going to have. I can't wait to, to see what, uh, what, what, what is in store for us. So thank you, Mrs. Mattingly. What a wonderful question. I appreciate it. Okay, we are at T minus 12 minutes. Again, we continue to be in a hold here. Let's check out New Shepard on the pad as she gets ready for her 14th mission to space and this rocket's maiden flight. All right, thank you everybody for joining us for our 14th New Shepard launch to space. We are at T minus 11 minutes and 30 seconds to go until launch. I understand we have just cleared the hold. Our team is ready to go. So thank you so much for your patience. Let's get ready to launch yeah. this rocket. I'm, I'm super stoked that we're going forward. Okay, we just had a couple of wonderful questions from schools around the country here. And I want to also send some shout outs to some other schools around the country, those that have sent some postcards that are flying on New Shepard today. So we've got Pinnacle Peak Preparatory in Arizona. I want to send a special hello to a star student there. Hi, Abby. In Florida, near our New Glen Rocket Factory, a special thank you to Grove Park Elementary, Andrew Robinson Elementary, and more. And Patrick, these postcards are coming from all around the world. We've got 13 countries so far. And fun fact, uh, today's flight officially completes the seventh out of seven continents. Uh, we have one postmark from a British research station in Antarctica. Isn't that cool? That's quite awesome. Literally. Or cool. Literally. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Um, if you want to send your postcard to space on New Shepard, visit the club's website for directions. Now, why don't we take a quick breather here and check out New Shepard while she gets ready for her flight. All right, that is a live look at New Shepard about to make her final preparations to go to space and back. Patrick, uh, while we have another moment here, why don't you take us through a profile of the flight today? Yeah, that sounds great, Ariane. So many of our viewers, I think, are going to recognize this. We've, we've done this uh, again and again as we keep uh, practicing and maturing our suborbital system. So we're going to start out by launching both the booster and the capsule you know, off of our uh, launch pad. Um, we're going to shoot up quite quickly, and at about uh, two and a half minutes uh, after launch, we're going to shut down that main engine on the booster. Shortly thereafter, we're going to separate the capsule and the booster. Um, they're going to obviously keep ascending up uh, because of all the you know, uh, speed we've actually been able to impart on them. That's the point, Ariane, where if you and I were in that capsule, we would unstrap and float around and just look out those great windows. Um, of course, in this uh, flight, Mannequin will stay where he is. I would do a somersault. <laughs> I know you would. I keep saying that. I'm going to do it one day. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, 
at that point, uh, the booster is going to come back down first because it's more aerodynamically shaped. So it's going to re-enter and then um, uh, it'll start slowing itself down. And then about 3,000 uh, feet above the surface, that BE3 PM engine is going to relight and then gently and very accurately and precisely land that rocket down on the north landing pad. In the meantime, uh, we would get back into our seats um, and strap back in. Uh, the capsule would re-enter. Um, and then after, after going through the atmosphere, Atmosphere, the drogue chutes are going to open up. They're going to help stabilize the capsule, and then they're going to pull the three main chutes out. We're going to see three great big chutes open, slow down the capsule, and then just before touchdown, we're going to see um, our, our terminal descent system uh, uh, shoot out a puff of air, which is going to kick up a lot of dust, but that puff of air is going to you know, allow a pillow soft landing for Mannequin and our future astronauts. Wonderful. One to two miles an hour, right? Super soft. Should be another beautiful launch and landing today. Well, I do want, while we have a, an extra minute here, I do want to talk a little bit about the launch, launch site one, West mm -hmm. Texas. We've talked about this before. It's not only where we launch and land New Shepard, as you were just talking mm -hmm. about, but it's also where we test our rocket engines. And I want to cut to a clip, fresh, hot, you know, fresh out, hot the oven <laughs> clip of our BE4 engine test from earlier this week that we've prepared for you. This is our BE4 engine, 550,000 pounds of thrust. That's in comparison to 110,000 pounds of thrust on the BE3 engine that's flying mm -hmm. today. Uh, we also, uh, it's, it's uh, LOX LNG, so mm -hmm. it's a different propellant. And here you see it firing. This is one of our two test stands that's down in West Texas. There's some drone footage that we compiled for you. That thing creates quite the rumble down <laughs> in the valley in Texas. And ultimately, on uh, it, this is going to propel uh, United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket as well as our new Glenn mm -hmm. vehicle. There will be seven of these engines on the base of New Glenn, and that is going to create a rumble down in Florida when we launch New Glenn. So kudos to our engine team for the progress mm -hmm. on this groundbreaking engine. Yeah. Okay, we are at T-minus five minutes and 50 seconds to go until launch. We're getting really close here. So let's do a quick recap of the headlines of mm -hmm. today's launch. Today, we're flying upgrade. Uh, Mannequin Skywalker is going to be occupying one of those seats. Uh, there will be push-to-talk capabilities in each seat. There will be speakers mm -hmm. uh, to hear mission control throughout the flight. There will be environmental systems, including a cooling system and humidity controls to regulate the temperature uh, inside the capsule. But in particular, that's also going to prevent these big, beautiful windows from fogging up during the flight. We're also testing a crew uh, alert system at each seat, which is, has important indicators to take you through the entire flight as an astronaut. And last but not least, you've seen in there the, the white acoustic paneling in there. That's to dampen any engine noises or any sorts of uh, other ambient noises. So in the final moments here, uh, all eyes are on New Shepard. We're at T minus four minutes and 40 seconds to go until launch. Right about now is when she's going to start to come alive. So mission control mm -hmm. at T minus two minutes throws the show over to uh, to New Shepard, and that's when she goes into autonomous mode from T minus two minutes through launch and landing. Mm. So we're going to throw it out to the pad, check out New Shepard here as she gets ready. And the next set that we'll come back for to talk you through are the final hydraulic system checks and the engine gimbal check.
All right, everybody, welcome back for New Shepard's 14th mission to space. You see the gantry retracting there. We are getting ready for a launch, Patrick. This is, get, this is when it gets really exciting. All right, we have thrown the show over to the rocket. She is in autonomous mode right now. We're waiting to see the final hydraulic system checks and engine gimbal check. There you go, you see the aft fins, making sure they've got full clearance there. There are four fins on the base of that rocket. You wanna check these aerodynamic surfaces and systems before flight, this is just exactly what a pilot does on an aircraft. Waiting here for the engine gimbal check, you see the nozzle there peeking out, there it goes. The engine is also obviously to propel the rocket, but is critical in guiding the rocket on its ascent, but as well as on its descent as it comes into land on the northern landing pad, just two miles north of where the rocket is taken off from. All right, and that takes us to launch. Let's hand it over to control. Here we go, New Shepard. Have a great flight, Mannequin Skywalker. Enjoy that shiny new capsule, and we'll see you back home soon at Launch Site 1. T-16, guidance internal. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. 2, 1, ignition. <laughs> go. Mission Control has confirmed New Shepard has cleared the tower on her way to space from Launch Site 1 in the West Texas desert with Mannequin Skywalker on board. Right about now, the fins on the aft portion of the vehicle are going to start help the vehicle do its roll maneuver. The booster is going to be rolling at about two to three degrees per second, which equates to a full rotation of the vehicle every two to three minutes. This, of course, is to give the astronauts a 360-degree view during the flight. All right, coming up here on max Q, maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket. It's the toughest part of the portion, toughest portion of the, of the flight for the rocket. And we've confirmed max Q, excellent. All right, you can see on the top right side of your screen, that's where you can follow along as we're gaining speed as she climbs up towards space. In the bottom left corner is the altimeter, noted in, in, in feet above ground level, although you may have noticed upon, uh, at liftoff, we were sitting at 3,700 feet above mean sea level. That's the altitude uh, of our West Texas launch site. Uh, now, Mannequin Skywalker in there, starting to feel those Gs, around three and a half Gs on the way up to space. It's very similar to a roller coaster, but in that horizontal position of the seats, definitely is a much more comfortable ride. All right, now approaching main engine cutoff, or MECO. So we're going to shut off the BE-3 engine. MECO is confirmed. Now you'll notice that the, the booster and the capsule are continuing as it, it's a, their combined ascent to space. As you watch the altitude continue to... Speed is dropping, of course as it no longer has the propulsion from the BE-3 engine. Separation of the two craft is confirmed. You can start to see the two craft in the screen.
Thank you again, everybody, for joining us live for New Shepard's 14th mission to space, the maiden launch for this rocket. So far, everything appears to be nominal. The two craft have separated right about now is when, if you were an astronaut in there, that's when you'd be able to float around, gaze out of those huge, gorgeous windows, maybe even do a somersault or two. I know I would certainly do that. And as we've noted in previous flights, if you follow along on the speed on the top right corner, as soon as that speed hits zero, that's when you know that the rocket and the capsule have hit its apogee point, the highest point in the flight of the rocket. There you go, it's hit zero and now they are heading back home. We should have an unofficial apogee altitude coming up here shortly. But we have gone well over 100 kilometers, the Kármán line, the official line of space, and there it is, 350,827 feet above, I believe, mean sea level. So that's, that is excellent, a great flight well over the Kármán line. Mannequin Skywalker is an astronaut once again. Now the capsule should be continuing to do its slow spin. Everybody gets a window seat in the capsule of New Shepard, but now we're making sure everybody gets the perfect view. All right, the two craft are heading back home now. The booster is going to beat the capsule back home. Obviously, it's more aerodynamically shaped, uh, and so it's going to come down first. Right about now, in the next 10 to 15 seconds or so, this is when we expect the rocket to hit atmospheric pierce point. That means that's when it's coming back in, and it's have it back, back home from space, and it has enough air pressure upon which it can use its aerodynamic surfaces to push, and that will help guide the rocket back to its landing pad, again, two miles north of where it's taken off from. We have confirmation that the wedge fins have been deployed. Those fins are at the forward section, the top section of the rocket. They're housed in the ring fin. They also help provide stability for the rocket as it comes in to land. And this booster is, is screaming home right about now. It is, it, at its maximum return velocity is just under Mach 4. So we're looking now for the drag brakes to deploy. As soon as those deploy, you'll see the speed come down very rapidly. You're starting to see that in the top right corner there. And then in quick succession, we're going to get the BE3 engine to restart. The landing gear will deploy, and then the booster will come in for a nice soft touchdown. There are the drag brakes. Touchdown! Welcome back, New Shepherd. Oh, you can hear our team back here at headquarters enjoying our, this moment for this rocket. What a day! Did a nice little maneuver there to bring it back to, back to the center of the pad, but that is what we're looking for—a ta completely autonomous system, Patrick. 
That never gets old. That's the type of stuff that makes live rocket launches and landings so exciting. I know. Every time, every time I see that booster come back, it's just like your heart's in your throat. But it's just it's so, so exciting to see it actually come back and just perfectly land down there. Incredible. Incredible. Kudos to our whole team for adding yet another rocket to our fleet. Wow. Okay. Well, the show is not over. That's right. We still uh, are waiting here for the crew capsule to come back. As noted, first the drogue chutes will deploy. Those are like the guide parachutes. The uh, mains will then deploy. You'll also see the mains then uh, inflate to full inflation. And once they're fully uh, inflated, that's when the, uh, the crew capsule starts to slow down comes in a nice 15, 16 miles an hour, a nice, a nice cruise back home. We'll wait for it to come back in to our valley uh, in West Texas, uh, and it will land. And just as we talked about, just in the last milliseconds, the retrothrust system fires, and it creates a nice pillow, air, air pillow, if mm -hmm. you will. So Mannequin Skywalker, by the time he touches down, it's just at about one mile an hour. It's a nice, soft touchdown. And there we go. The crew capsule has its mains deployed, fully inflated. What an incredible day for the team. What a beautiful shot. You know, Mannequin Skywalker, I mean, <laughs> if he had adrenaline, his heart would be, would be thumping pretty hard. What a day. All the way up over the Carmen line and back, coming in for a nice soft cruise back into our West Texas Valley there. Just about 400 feet above ground level. We're waiting for the retro thrust systems to fire and then a nice soft landing. And touchdown. <laughs> what a day. What a beautiful shot. Congratulations to all of Team Blue. Really well deserved. This is our 14th mission. A safe landing for the booster, safe landing for the crew capsule. We added a little. We were talking about add a little bit of char to the bottom of the, uh, to the bottom of that rocket. Came back nice and clean though. Look at that, absolutely spectacular. Now, if you were an astronaut on board that capsule, there you would have had an incredible ride up over the Carmen line and back. Get the big beautiful views out of the. You know, the, we did the mm -hmm. 360 degree spin this time. Get your three minutes of of weightlessness. I can't wait to check out the onboard cameras to see the views that Mannequin Skywalker experienced today. Just what a day. I know. And, and how about those drone shots of the, of the rocket and, and actually the capsule coming down? Those were pretty spectacular. Those were beautiful. <laughs> looks like a nice clean landing right there in the desert. Everything looks to have gone perfectly today. So our recovery crew is going to be headed out to the crew capsule to open up the hatch, mm -hmm. inspect the craft, greet Mannequin Skywalker, and retrieve the postcards on board. Yeah, I, you know, I always think about this moment when I try to visualize, you know, what would it be like to actually fly on New Shepard and be coming right back down? And so you just landed safely, the hatch just opens, and now for the first time you step out of the hatch and back onto Earth, and, and, and you're an astronaut. And, and, and you've, just, you've, you've seen the Earth from 100 kilometers up from space just moments ago, and now here you are back on it. I mean, that must just be incredible. Um, but let's, this was such an exciting mission, such an exciting day. Let's take a look at some of the replays here to show you that gorgeous takeoff and landing. There we go, the BE-3 engine firing, 110. 110,000 pounds of thrust. 
pushing that rocket and the crew engine as the rocket is taking off is just incredible. It sh shakes your bones. <laughs> it really does. And, uh, you, you know, as it takes off, like, it goes really fast. There's a lot of rockets where, you, you know, the ascent is actually quite slow. But this one, I mean, it's it's flying. It's going. It's gone. <laughs> Yeah, and as we said earlier, today is, is a huge win, not just for New Shepard, but also for our human landing system and, and, and our return to the moon. That BE-3 engine that you see right there, that's a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen uh, propellant combination. And that's, that's the same combination that we use on BE-7, our lunar lander engine. And you can just, I mean, right there, you can see that power, you know, when it launches and you can see that precision when it lands too, right? When you throttle it down, you get that nice precision landing. Nice soft landing. And so, you know, if we were just building New Shepard just to do this mission, the, the suborbital mission, we would have probably chosen, you know, a different propellant type, something much easier to, to deal, to work with. But this combination is just so powerful and so efficient and so useful. You know, we we use it on the upper stage of New Glenn, again, in order to get that uh, efficiency. And, and that's, that's why we're also using it on the BE-7 engine that will power that descent element for the human landing system for NASA's, you know, Artemis program. And, you know, as we all know, there's water ice in the South Pole on the moon. So I imagine one day here in a very near future when we have built out our, our South Pole infrastructure on the moon, we're going to be able to use that water, break it down to liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, refuel our lander and use it again and again. I mean, that's going to go such a long way to make our sustainable presence on the moon. Absolutely. I, I can't wait to see the lunar lander and then the lunar lander with humans on yes. board, right? Every program here at Blue Origin has been, has been designed for human spaceflight from the very beginning. And as for today's mission, as we mentioned, we flew some upgrades to the astronaut experience inside this capsule that you see on the screen. So we're getting really close to flying humans. We're getting there. And as we watch the, reto the recovery team, why don't we run through some of the upgrades that we had on board today? So the capsule that you see there, there were six flight seats on board. Mannequin Skywalker, of course, was in one of them. The speakers in the cabin uh, have a, a microphone now and a push to talk button at each seat so the astronauts can talk to mission control on the ground at all times. We flew the crew alert system, which has a panel on each seat with lights and sounds that convey important safety messages. The wall linings in the capsule help suppress engine and ambient noise for comfortable acoustics inside the cabin. Mm -hmm. Also, environmental systems, including a cooling system and humidity controls to regulate temperatures and prevent uh, the, the capsule, windows, capsule windows from fogging up during flight. Of course, when you're up there, you want to see that gorgeous yeah. view. So some really exciting stuff. You see there on your screen there, that's our recovery team that has made it out to the capsule. As we mentioned, they're going to open up the hatch greet Mannequin Skywalker back, <laughs> and then get those postcards because we want to stamp them flown to space and send them out to, to all the kids. So before we close out here, I do hear that we have the statistics from today's mission. Why don't we take a look? These, of course, are unofficial statistics. We will release the official statistics after the webcast. So crew capsule apogee, 350,827 feet. Maximum ascent velocity, 2,242 miles per hour. Mission start time, 11.17 a.m. Central Time. Mission elapsed time, 10 minutes and 15 seconds. That's super inspiring. I mean, it's, it's so exciting to see us be able to, you know, hit these numbers over and over. And, you know, if you were inspired, just like we were super inspired by what you saw here today, and, and want to come help us, you know, build that road to space, you know, we're, we're hiring across all of our locations in the United States. We're hiring for New Shepard, for New Glenn, for engines, and of course, for advanced development programs or for our human landing system. So I encourage everybody to go onto our website and actually go check those uh, uh, listings out. Come and, join uh, get the team. Yeah, come join the team. Help us build the roads to space. And of course, you can also commemorate today's launch. You can pick up one of these really cool official uh, New Shepard 14 uh, mission patches in other gear at our shop by going to shop.blueorigin.com. Look at that cool mission patch right there, man. I, I want to add that to my collection. Yeah, I was going to say, don't you have all of them? I do, all of them. <laughs> that is really, really cool. Well, I know that there are a lot of folks that want to get their hands on them, so again, please go to that website. 
All right, that is all from here. I want to thank everybody for tuning in for New Shepard's 14th flight to space. The success of this flight puts us one really big step closer to flying astronauts. And um, Patrick, uh, there's going to be a lot of fun ahead in 2021. Awesome. All right, guys, stay in touch with us. And in the interim, stay safe out there. And as always, Bernard Ferociter.